Welcome back, everybody. All right. I thought I'd share with you what's behind me on my screen, my make believe screen. It's a list of chemicals and some some uh, flavors that you may be familiar with. I just want to show you that if you look on the right side, uh, those are the chemicals that you're eating, which is really fascinating in that those, they're, they're a class of compounds called esters. We won't talk about those here. This is like in a class like organic chemistry or the, the next 151, 152 chemistry. But those class of compounds that I have listed here are made from alcohols and another class of compounds called organic acids. In themselves, they taste terrible and smell bad but you combine them and you make all these flavors that you see that correlate uh, the, the fruit or, or uh, uh, herb that's there. So, and they just combine them together and make these nice little chemicals. Okay, well, let us um, get a few more people coming in. Let us continue. What I'm gonna do here is uh, do chapter three. We'll knock that out. Uh, it's fairly um, short. Then I'm going to go over some of the questions and the activities. I haven't complete, completed all of them, but I'm going to go over one of the questions, specifically the one about the sig figs, and then maybe a couple of the problems in the conversion part. Now, a note about uh, uh, turning in uh, assignments, uploading assignments. If for some reason you are having the challenge, and it happens, uh, you can't convert it to PDF. Reason we state PDF because PDF is pretty universal, easy to open, no matter what platform you're utilizing, uh, and so that's why we we say submit a PDF. If you can't submit a PDF, I have no problem if you take a take a snapshot of your assignment and send that up. Submit that. Okay, I will take JPEGs. Uh, there is one format out there. It's a HEIC format. I don't know for sure that's uh, which phone that is that creates those. I have a challenge with opening those, so uh, I w I do have a uh, a, uh, a, uh, a program that will open it. Some, but like I said, it's like a 50-50 chance. So if you can convert it to JPEG, perfect. If you can't, we'll we'll figure it out. Okay. All right, so um, uh, let's see, let's see. All right, well, let me jump into chapter three. Some of the stuff we already talked about a little bit. I, I did introduce the the uh, the files about uh, within the metric units, uh, millimeters, centimeters, etc. Uh, I did introduce the the letters or the units we use to designate length, which is meters, uh, uh, G, lowercase g, which is grams for mass, capital L, which is important, capital L, is a symbol for volume in metric, which is liters, and then both the English and the metrics uh, use S for uh, seconds. Okay, um, what this chapter does is basically we're going to start converting first within the a, a system within the metric system, convert maybe centimeters and meters, something like that. And then we're going to go from the metric into the uh, English units. Now, this exercise is what we're showing you how to go from point A to point B, because we're going to use the same technique. All right, the same technique when we start doing calculations in chemical reactions. Okay, so uh, that that the PDF file that talks about the metric prefixes, we talked about that. The K prefix letter is for a thousand times larger, which is kilo. D for deci or 10 times smaller for deciliters, uh, decimeters, okay? You remember there are 10 years in a decade, DEC, okay? So it helps you out remember 10 times smaller. Um, C for centi, the prefix centi, which again, 100 years in a century, right? So that helps you out. It's 100 times smaller. And M uh, stands for uh, milli, which is a thousand times. There's a 
thousand years in the millennium. Okay. Uh, hence the Millennium Falcon, maybe. No, guess not. Huh? And then the last one you may not be familiar with. It's a, a Greek symbol. It looks like a U. It is lowercase U. Got a little leg up front. That is called the micro. Okay. So that is a million times smaller. So a microliter is a million times smaller than a liter. There are a million microliters in one liter. Okay. All right, when we, we talked about these in one milliliter, these are conversion factors. There are 100 centimeters, one meter, there's 10 decimeters. And it's just some selections here. One kilometer, there are a thousand meters. And in one meter, there are a million micrometers. And here they're using meters, but remember, you can take that last letter M, the lowercase m, and replace it with capital L. So these could be liters or, or grams. And then in one meter, there are a thousand milliliters. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now we're going to utilize what's, what the text calls the factor label method. You also may hear the term uh, uh, dimensional analysis, fancy words for hey, keep, keep it simple, keep track of your units. Okay. Set up your problem such that you keep track of your units. The units cancel out as they, uh, as you want them to be, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, and then you you you're all you're good to go. So uh, point number one, stepwise, and we'll go this stepwise. It's always good to develop a step method, and then eventually you can you know go out there and convert it, do it as you feel more comfortable with. Step number one, we want to identify the, the units that we're looking for, okay? And, and in doing that, uh, we're keeping track of our units because we're looking for units of whatever, depends on the problem, so I write that down. And so in essence, it's saying this, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be given something, something will be given in units, okay? Obviously, I'm gonna have factors here of, X number, it could be one factor, two factors, three factors, whatever it takes. And I'm going to eventually uh, end up in the units that I'm what the question asks. And so I'm keeping track of my units. This is what I'm trying to find. This is unit wise what I'm given and value. And in between here, I got factors that I'm going to utilize to first cancel the first units that I'm given. Okay, and then eventually progress to the units that I'm looking for. Okay, that I'm looking for. And in between here, I have all these conversion factors that I have access to that will get me from point A to point B. Okay, I identify the given, what is my starting point, identify what I'm given, and then I multiply by conversion factors to get me to the units that I'm looking for. Uh, keeping track of my units, okay? And finally, at the end, I uh, don't round off the answer depending on the significant figures. Now, keep in mind, that there, there, are only, there are only three conversion factors, two conversion factors that are measurements. Everything else is a um, exact number. Therefore, it would not play a factor with respect to the final sig figs. Okay, I'll, I'll give you some examples here when, when, when we get to them. Okay, now uh, you may be asked to submit um, some problems or show your work. Basically, it's showing all the conversion factors as you went from point A to point B. Because it's quite easily, you one can go, hey, you know, do Google convert uh, 10 micrograms to mil uh, grams. Okay, type that in, you get the answer. It doesn't show us how you got the answer, okay? Because we want you to develop a technique to get to the answer because we're gonna utilize this technique down the road, okay? Down the road with chemical reaction. For example, the question says here, is asking you how many liters are in 2,389 milliliters, all right? So identify the units that you're looking for. I'm looking for liters. And so obviously I'm gonna set up something with equal 
leaders. That is what my final units will be. I'm given 2,389 milliliters. So I write down what I'm given. Okay. And now actually I'm going to have at least one conversion factor here. Why? Because I'm going simply from milliliters to liters. So I, I know I'm going to have one conversion factor. That, that being said is, is this. My conversion factor must have milliliters in the denominator. Why? Because I want to get rid of the units of milliliters. And in the denominator, did I say denominator? I meant numerator. <laughs> denominator. In the numerator, the units must be liters. Why? Because that is what I'm looking for. Okay. And based on my whole database of conversion factors that you have access to, and we talked about, I know that there are one, in one liter, there are a thousand milliliters. Okay. So I set the problem up. All right. I then invert that thousand. I knew you might be tempted to invert it and go 0 0.001 liters per milliliter. Don't do that. Just keep them all whole here, okay? Because you don't want to uh, lose track of all your conversion factors and, and, uh, and uh, lose track of your final answer. So everything's set up. Check it off. I got my milliliters canceled out like it should. Um, I got units of liters at the end, which is what the question asked for. Second of all, look at your sig figs. I got four sig figs here, okay? And these, the conversion factor is exact. And so would not play a factor in sig figs. So the final answer must have four sig figs. And so here I, here I did, I set it up, systematic approach set up all the variables that I that I need, all the things I'm looking for from units to sig figs, and now I just do the math and I'm, I'm good to go, okay? Obviously, I took a lot of steps and that's okay because that's what we're learning here, how to attack these problems with a, a, a stepwise. Eventually, you're gonna realize and, 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 and recognize some things and you don't have to, in, for you to go through those steps. But for right now, yes, we are. So we set that set up what we're given. Uh, we need a conversion factor, all right? And you can see that our milliliters cancel like we set that up. The units that we're looking for are in liter because that's what the question asks for. And then look at your sig figs. Sig figs are set up properly for sig figs for the answer. Okay, well, uh, next one. We're still notice we're still keep in this scenario, we are uh, still within the, the, the metric units. We went from liters to milliliters. Now we're going from kilometers to uh, centimeters or vice versa, centimeters to kilometers. All right, so I write down what I'm given, which is 12,300 centimeters. I need conversion factors here, okay? And I set that up so that my first conversion factor, I want to get rid of centimeters because I know that in one meter, there are 100 centimeters, 100. So I set that up. Well, that leaves me with units of meters, which is not what we're striving for at the end. Okay, so I need one more factor here to get rid of meters and give me kilometers. So that's where one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters. Now, it is feasible to take those two conversion factors and make one, and that's quite okay if you notice the, the, the trend here, okay? Uh, but I'm setting them up separately to demonstrate we're going systematic approach. And then eventually when I get more proficient in solving these problems, I can combine my conversion factors and have one conversion factor. And there's nothing wrong with that if you recognize what you're doing here. And I'll have some more examples of that. So both these conversion factors are exact numbers and therefore our, ans our answer would, the sig figs would not be a factor there based on the conversion factors. And so the, the uh, one, two, three, zero, zero, there are three sig figs there. Our answer should only have three sig figs. 
And so 12,300 centimeters is equal to 0 0.123 kilometers, okay? Uh, now, you might say, well, what if you inadvertently, inadvertently inverted the numbers, okay? Let's say uh, uh, you went, instead of dividing, you, you did 100 over 1, and you did 1,000 over 1, okay? And you multiply that number out, and you get this big, humongous number. So look at the answer and, and ask yourself, does that answer make sense based on what I'm given to begin with? We're in centimeters, okay? Which is, you know, a hundred times smaller than a kilometer, which means that my number here is gonna be a lot smaller than the 12,300, okay? It's not going to be greater than 12,300 with respect to the number and then having the units of kilometer. That, that number has to be much less. And so if you inadvertently in, inverted your conversion factors, multiply it out, well, you can see 1,000 times 100 times 12,300 and give you a big number. And, and that should be a flag. So not only... Uh, when you look at, uh, when you do the calculation and look at the answer, ask yourself the question, does that answer make sense? Is it consistent with what I did to it mathematically and what I, the numbers I was given? Okay. Don't just, just throw the numbers in calculator and assume it's correct. You do a, a final analysis on that. Now, um, you might say, why? why? <laughs> Believe me, you know, working in, working in science myself, every time we did any type of calculation, prediction, we went and double check our numbers, okay? I've had engineers before, for whatever reason, one set of engineers be working in English units and the other set of engineers would be working with metric units and the data that was combined from each Per each group just did not make sense, okay? Because we're looking, we're multiplying, dividing, doing whatever, and we're like, something's not wrong. So we have to go back and tell them, hey, one of you guys need to switch over, okay? All right, give me, give me two, 30 seconds. All right, I'm back. All right, so those we talked about the metric units, and here are some English units. And we I also talked about the two cups of the pint, two pints in a quart, four quarts in a gallon, and then you got leg twelve inches in a foot, three feet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, there's others, five thousand two hundred eighty feet in a mile. Any combination that thereof. And a lot of these converge, conversion factors, you can combine, okay? But I put them out there for you and realize that each conversion factor, again, is a ratio that I can write one or two ways. We got the letter G here, uh, which represents the uh, gallon, okay? And so within the, get, within the big G here, you got, uh, so one gallon, you got four Qs, which represent the quarts, okay? Now, within the quart, you have four Ps, which represent two pints. You got two pints in there, two Ps, I mean, not four. And within the P, with the pint, you have two letter Cs, which represent two cups. And so you have, you know, uh, three conversion factors here, of which you can combine into one, if you like. Uh, in fact, you can see here, hopefully, that one gallon, can anybody, anybody know how many cups in one gallon, based on what I'm given here? Wouldn't that be 16 cups? Or times two, times two, 16 cups, so that's another conversion factor. 
that you can utilize instead of putting them on, putting them all together. If if you can see that, if you can't see that at this point, ignore what I just said and just go a systematic approach. All right. So here we're asked the question: How many gallons in four forty four point five cups? And so uh, we are looking for gallons, unit wise. Okay, that's what the problem says. We need 45 uh, cups that we're given. And so you're probably gonna have a couple of conversion factors here, right? The first one, obviously, we're gonna get rid of the cups. So our, what relationship we know with, with respect to cups and anything else? Well, we know that in, two, in, in one pint, there are two cups, right? And so that tells us we get rid of the cups here, but we got we need pints to get rid of. So we got pints over here, denominator. Notice how I know I got to put in denominator. And do I have a relationship of that relates with pints and anything else other than cups? Yeah, quarts. We know that there are two pints in one quart. Okay. And so our pints are taken care of. And now that means I need one more conversion factor that gets rid of quarts. It has to be denominator, okay? And gives me gallons. And so I know in one gallon, there are four quarts, okay? So you notice there I went from unit to unit and I kept track of it and followed through making sure I set it up properly so my units cancel out. And now I'm, I'm all set up. And so now the math is on you. You plug it in. Okay, and you end up with, uh, keep, in, keep in mind that all those three conversion factors are exact numbers and therefore would not be a factor with respect to sig figs. 44.5 cups is three sig figs. So our answer would be 2.78 gallons represents 44.5 cups, okay? All right, so just to, just to make you aware, notice, look at the conversion factors in here. Notice that the quarts cancel out, the pints cancel out, just looking at the factors. So I end up with one gallon over 16 cups, right? Four times two times two. Okay, so that in itself is one factor or any combination thereof. All right, we need inches in three and a half yards. So we write down what we're given. Okay, we know that there are three feet in the yard and I got to get rid of feet. We know there's 12 inches in the foot. So with respect to units, my yards are canceled, feet canceled, inches are left and it's perfect because that's what I'm looking for. Okay, and um, that re represents 126 inches mathematically. Now the question here is this, is that the correct answer? Can I put the answer as 126? No. No, I can't. And why is that? Because there's only two six figs in the first, uh, in 3.5 yards. You got it. There are two sig figs right here, 3.5. These are exact, the three feet and the 12 inches, they're exact numbers, so they won't be a factor. And with two sig figs, our answer is three sig figs, okay? So we have to do like we were doing with the previous chapter, find the two sig fig position, which is the two, okay? Round it, okay, based on the rules, and we look at the neighbor, neighbor is six, then therefore that means that the two gets bumped up two. Would this be correct? Would that be a correct answer? 13 inches. No. No, you are 100% correct. Because you know what happens with a lot of a lot of these type of exercises, 
that six, remember it's, it is before the decimal point. So you have to convert it, all numbers before the decimal point, either if they're zero, they stay zero or they get converted because the magnitude that we're in is in the hundred place. This magnitude is in the 10 place. So that obviously is correct. So our answer would be 130 inches, okay? All right, good. 130 inches. All right, now <laughs> we give you, <clears throat> excuse me, we give you these three conversion factors that go from metric to, to um, <clears throat> uh, English, metric English, okay? And one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And then one pound is 454 grams. One quart is uh, 946 millimeters, all right? Now use these conversion factors. I know you can Google and, and get conversion factors, but these conver conversion factors are utilized to uh, um, give you the correct answer in Canvas. Canvas is set on these conversion factors, okay? Because uh, you can go out there and get four, four, five, four point, blah, 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 all kinds of numbers and that, that's gonna mess you up with respect to sig figs. So just use these. Of these three conversion factors, two of them are approximate and therefore um, are, are measurements and uh, can be a factor with respect to sig figs. And so one pound, there are 454 grams with three sig figs. One quart, 946 milliliters, okay? Both of these have three sig figs. And therefore, if you utilize this, these two conversion factors, they could be a factor and are used to determine the number of sig figs. The other one that um, I, I want to follow convention with everyone else, it is treated as an exact open to argument because to me it's, it's a measurement. So the one inch is 2.54 centimeters exactly. <laughs> okay, so therefore, that conversion factor would not be a factor with respect to sig figs in your calculation, okay? So keep, keep that in mind in your answers. And if you use, them, for example, how many pounds in 248 grams? So we are given 248 grams. We have the conversion factor, which is given to us. If one pound is equal to 454 grams, okay? Uh, we set it up with grams in the denominator because as, as before, we are keeping track of our units and we can see we set this up properly unit wise. So uh, we should end up with uh, 0 0.546 pounds in 248 grams, okay? Um, here's one where we question is how many inches are in 3.54 times 10 to the negative kilometers. So here's an example of using scientific notation to input that number into your calculator. Now, obviously you can write it longhand, that's fine. But if that number was times 10 to the negative, you know, negative 100, then you would have to use scientific notation to put that number into your calculator. All right, so we have a multiple of, of uh, conversion factors here, which again, you can combine into, into one until, until you recognize that, but until such a time, keep it separate. Okay, we are given 3.54 times 10 to the negative three kilometers. So we set up where we need to get rid of kilometers and we have a conversion factor that tells us that there are a thousand meters in one kilometer. So I set up my first one that puts me in units of meters, which is not where I need to be. So I need one more conversion factor to get rid of, get rid of, of uh, uh, meters. Now, the other aspect is this, I'm going, need to go into inches from kilometers. I'm going from English to metric. So obviously at the end, I need a conversion factor to get me into the units, English units. And one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. 
okay? And that's the units I need to be in based on the problem. And so I need a converged factor that eventually gets rid of the centimeters. So obviously I know that there are 100 centimeters in one meter, plus I get rid of meters, plus I get rid of uh, meters and centimeters is what I meant to say, leaving me with units of inches. All three of those conversion factors are exact numbers and therefore would not play a role with respect to sig figs. So our answer is 139 inches in 3.54 times 10 to the negative three meters. All right, here we have a two liter bottle, soda bottle, and we're trying to calculate how many quarts. And so we know that in two liters, we got to get, get out of the liters and into quarts. Well, this is the conversion factor that we're given that one quart is equal to 946 milliliters, okay? That's the units we're looking for based on the problem, okay? So that obviously is going to be the last conversion factor, which means that I need to first convert my, my liters into milliliters. So that cancels there. There is a thousand milliliters in the liter. So therefore my milliliters cancel. It's set up properly. Now I do the math. Keep in mind that 946 uh, is a measurement and could be a factor. It's not exact. So it could be a factor with respect to sig figs. I got three sig figs at 946, but I am given uh, 2.0, which has two sig figs, so our answer would be 2.1 quarts in two liters. Okay. All right. Um, also, the other aspect is this. Uh, you might be tempted to say, well, uh, uh, two liters, it's about two quarts. Well, that would be incorrect because with respect to sig figs, you are accurate to the 10 place. All right, so instead of presenting it as two quarts, you, that will be incorrect with respect to your sig figs, okay? Uh, so keep track of your sig figs. All right, uh, there are conversion factors. I mean, the, 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 the worksheets to do, uh, practice, 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 okay? The more you do, the better, better off you do. And even, you know, if you need to uh, Google some examples or some everyday examples around you that you want to convert from English to metric, okay? And if you have a question about them, yeah, shoot me an email. We'll, uh, we'll work it through. All right. Any questions about that, the factored method? You know, keep track of your unit, set up your problems, such that you know you start to set them up properly where they cancel out to to the point where you are uh, at at the end with the units that you need okay and <clears throat> excuse me we'll find as we work we as we use this technique down the road with respect to chemical equations that we'll probably need on the average about three three conversion factors to get us from apples to oranges, okay? But we'll be utilizing the same technique. So, excuse me, if you yes, mind, can I ask a question really quick? You, you bet. Uh, okay, so just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, because I was a little lost when I was doing um, the activity. Um, so if we're going from like, let's just say kilograms or, um, yeah, kilo, no, kilometers, to uh, feet, right? right? So are you saying that uh, based on the conversion, um, that conversion chart that you put out there, I don't need to worry about the, kilo, um, the K in front of it. I would just need to, or maybe not the meter, don't worry about the miller part, but look at the kilo. And that's what helps me figure out how many are in, like say for instance, a meter to work my way up to feet. Okay, yeah. Okay, let, let me let me set one up here real quick. If that's if I'm yeah, if you understand okay. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, let me let me see if I understand what you're saying. So let's say, for example, you asked the problem, uh, um, 
I got 5.0 kilometers, right? And uh, the question right. is, how many feet in 5.0 kilometers? Okay, would that work? Yeah, that'll work. Okay. So before you answer, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm working my way down, you know, like going from kilometer to meter to, I, maybe I did it too much, to yeah. yards to, you know, but you, go ahead. No, no, you, you use as many units as you need that you feel comfortable that you follow to get oh. me to, to feet, okay? If it takes one unit, it, because you, com you recognize that you combine them into one, that's fine. But right now, you know, like you said, I want to take the kilometers. Okay, what do I know? Since I'm going, uh, ask yourself the question in this problem. I'm going from metric to feet. So that means that in one inch, right, I know that there are 2.54 centimeters, right? That's my conversion factor. If you can read that, that didn't come up very well. One inch, that's my conversion factor that will that, that that connects meters to inches right okay that means that i gotta take these kilometers and convert them to the point where i can get to feet so let's do the first one all right so where you go from the metric system back to the english system that's what i'm right? doing here yes exactly okay the kilometers is metric and I'm going to feet. So I'm going to need this factor eventually to get me from out of the metric and into the English. Okay. And so let's 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 run it through. Let's set it up. So right now I got kilometers. And so do I can you think of a unit that has kilometers? Because remember, I want to get rid of kilometers. So I gotta need kilometers down at the bottom. Now, if you look at that table I gave you, I have a table that showed you that in one kilometer, how many how many meters? A thousand. Were, you got it. Okay. All right. So what is what does that do? That gets rid of my kilometers, right? Yep. Okay. Now, I, that will put me in meters. Now, keeping in mind that my final unit that I'm going to use over here it will. I'm going to need units of centimeters eventually so I can get from centimeters to inches. How can I convert to centimeters? Well, I know that I have to put meters in the bottom here, correct? Because well, right. I want to get rid of that. So I also tell me that I want to put centimeters on top, right? Because okay. I'm, I'm being aware that my conversion factor right here is in centimeters, 2.54 centimeters. So how many centimeters in one meter? What's the prefix? Uh, What's, how many years? 100, 100. You got it. 100. Now, do not my meters cancel? At this, I see. At this point, I mean the units of centimeters. Now I can use that final conversion factor that takes me out of centimeters, the metric. These two first two factors were put, uh, are in the metric system. Now I got to get out of there and into the English. So I know that in one inch, there are 2.54 centimeters, right? Right. Do not my centimeters cancel now? I'm in the units of inch. Now, do I need something else to get me into feet? I would think this is just a feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't I don't I know okay. that don't I know that there are in 12 inches there's one foot, right? Yes. So I need one more factor here, right? There where I got 12, oh. 12 inches in one foot. My inches cancel. Notice I haven't, I just put the numbers in. I haven't, don't do the math. Just put the numbers I in there. Right. Yeah. And so now, with respect to my units, am I not at the foot units? Yeah, you're there now. It's at the top. 
you got right? it. And, and, yep. It's on top. I'm at the end there. I don't want to confuse all this here. Yeah. And so now it's a matter of you plugging in the numbers. So I get 5.5, okay, times 1,000, times uh, uh, 100, divided by 2.54, divided by 12. I'll let you do the math there. And you got two figs to work with because all of those num all those factors are exact numbers. Okay. Okay, one second. Yeah. So at the point being, if you're in metric going into English, those three factors there will that I get that we talked about earlier. Let me show you. I see. I got. I see. I think I, I was reading a little bit too much into it. Yeah. I, I wasn't I, thinking going from metric to English. Yeah. If 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 the question was to say, you know, how many centimeters, then I would have stopped with the first two factors because I'm in centimeters, right? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So that's why they call it the factor label method because you're you're following your units, so you have to always be aware of the units that you need to end up with, and that's going to determine how you set up the factors and which factors you put in to make sure that the previous units get canceled out properly, okay? And these factors here are given to you, they're in the shapes table. So that get, these convert you from metric to English conversions, okay? And so if I'm, we just utilize this, this means that if I need to get into inches, Eventually, I'm going to be in centimeters. So if I start off with kilometers, I got to make my factors get to the centimeters. Okay. Now, if you can recognize this, if you take those four factors that we just worked with and you multiply them all together, units cancel, you can make one factor that, can, that uh, combines uh, feet and kilometers. Okay, but I don't want I don't want to confuse you. The, what I did here was systematic approach, set the factors up such that the previous factors cancel out, and I'm striving to get to the units that I'm looking for based on the question that was asked. Okay, is that a little bit clearer? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, good question. All right, let me clear up my mess here. All right, so let's, let's briefly talk about volume because we're going to talk about density and how to use density. Density is, is a ratio. We kind of briefly talked about it earlier, I think the first chapter. It's a ratio of mass over volume. Now, volume, we can do it a couple, we can determine volume a couple ways. One, if you have a box, a rectangular box, something that's measurable, that's real simple to do. We can measure length times width times height, okay? Length, it, whatever units you're using, if you're using centimeters or meters or whatever, whatever the length units, uh, you could be in cubic inches or you could be in cubic centimeters at the end, okay? But that is volume by direct measurement. There are times, however, when you have a material like this pen that I have here, I. I, I can measure the mass of everything that I have because I, I can just simply weigh it, okay? But the volume is a little bit different. The volume, if, if it's not an easy box, rectangular, square box, uh, I have to do what's called volume by displacement. And this is analogous to the hot tub. Think about it. <laughs> All right, after a long day at work, you know, you go to your hot tub, swimming pool, bathtub, whatever, you know, it has an X amount of volume in that container. You jump in, or what, what, so you you sit in carefully. What happens to the volume of your hot tub, bathtub, swimming pool? It goes up, right? And if you completely immerse yourself in that container, in hot tub, whatever you're in, and you had a way to measure where the volume was to begin with and where the volume is after you totally immerse, guess what? That difference in measurement, that's important. That difference in measurement of volume would be your volume that you displaced, okay? And that's volume by displacement. 
For example, you have a diamond ring, a diamond. You put it into a cylinder. We had a picture of a cylinder, just, just graduated cylinder. It's got markings. It contains 20 milliliters of water. Well, you take the diamond and you dump it in there. It is masked, and just like you jumping into the hot tub or any tub, the volume goes up. Okay, so it displaces an X amount of volume. So the new volume measurement, it goes from 20 milliliters to 34.7 milliliters. Now, you have to remember, it's the difference of where it ended minus the, where it initially started, that is the volume. The diamond did not displace 34.7 milliliters of, it's, that's a pretty big diamond, okay? It, displace the difference of 34.7 minus the 20. And so it actually displaced 14.7 milliliters. And that is the volume of that diamond, okay? And so this is uh, for objects that we cannot readily measure length, width, and height. Uh, for irregular objects, irregular shape objects, we use a technique called volume of displacement. Okay. All right. So we uh, let's talk about this. So if for a rectangular box, obviously we measure length, width, and height. And so if we have a shoe box that is 24 centimeters by 11 centimeters by 16 centimeters, its volume would be 4,200 4, cubic centimeters. Remember the units, centimeters times centimeters is equal to centimeter squared times centimeters is equal to cubic centimeters, okay? And if we were for some reason multiplying that by centimeters, a centimeter to the fourth, et cetera, centimeter to the fifth, so on and so forth. So when we multiply like terms, we're simply moving the coefficient. It's like 10 times 10 to the one, 10 to the third power, the fourth power, et cetera, okay? Um, the answer should, again, we keep track of our sig figs. We are multiplying here, both 24, 11, and 16 have two sig figs. So therefore our answer, again, must have two sig figs and 4,200 does have two sig figs. So that's been properly, properly uh, displayed. Now, with respect to mass, the mass is a ratio. Remember that just like these conversion factors is a ratio, so is density. And that ratio is the mass divided by volume, okay? And the units, the, the majority of the time that the units that you will see are the ones in the middle, which is grams per uh, milliliter. Those are the most, uh, most common units utilized. Yes, you'll see it as grams per cubic uh, centimeter, you'll see it as kilograms per cubic millimeters. You'll see, you'll see all kinds of, of uh, units, but uh, the majority ones we would be using are uh, grams per milliliter, okay? So think of density. Uh, Dina, I think you got your, your, your mic on. Let me meet you there. Got you. I was getting some feedback here. All right. Now, <laughs> The density is a physical property of matter, okay? Now, if um, you all heard the old adage about uh, which weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of, of steel, obviously they're both the same, okay? But if you ask the question, who has a higher density, a ton of, feathers or a ton of steel? And the answer there is it depends. It depends on the volume. Now, obviously the steel will have a set volume, right? And so we would measure it as a big chunk of steel, its volume, we measure its, its mass and we have its density. But the feather, you know, there we can squish them. We can squish the feathers together and guess what? Change the density. Uh, a good analogy is a loaf of bread. You, you go to the store, you buy a nice loaf of bread. I had all my boys when I was younger. We go to the store, buy the nice loaf of bread. And then they would help me pack it up and they put it in the bottom of the bag. And when you get home, that bread now has been squished. 
Now, that bread has X amount of mass, right? And an X amount of volume. We can measure length, width, and height. But if I take that bread, that loaf of bread, and I squish it, which I can, I change the volume. I didn't change the mass, but I changed the volume, which in effect, guess what? Changes the number, okay? I decrease the volume, guess what? The density of a loaf of bread fresh would be much less than the density of a loaf of bread that I collapse because I decrease the denominator, its number. And mathematically, the density goes up, right? Okay, all right, so which state of matter has, is most dense is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is the solid. The gases are the ones that are least dense. For, there's some examples of uh, density measurements or watt values in units of grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter. You can see how the density of air is pretty um, small compared to say gold, which has around 18.9 grams per cubic centimeter. We can use density to help us identify somewhat uh, compounds. Uh, we can uh, look at their density, it's a physical property. It's not a 100% uh, procedure, but it, well, density does help us identify things. All right, Calculate ca density calculations. We can calculate the density itself simply by knowing the mass, knowing the volume, and we got the density. Or we can calculate the mass or the volume of that material given the density of, of the material because the density is a ratio. And remember that ratio, we can write it either as grams per milliliter or we can write it as milliliters per gram, okay? For example, density of chloroform, which is a chemical people they used to use to knock you out when you went, had an operation, has a density of 1.48 grams per mil, uh, milliliter. Okay, uh, is kind of a help as a guideline to help you. Density of water we, at room temperature is one. So anything that has a density greater than one will uh, um, sink relative to water. Okay. Uh, so obviously gold, metals, and stuff, very high density, they're going to drop like a rock. All right, <laughs> so <clears throat> that ratio can be written as 148, 1.48 grams per mil or inverted, okay? Just like the conversion factors we've been working with. Here, it's straightforward uh, density calculation. They give you the, the weight of the, the, the necklace and its volume that it had. Maybe they measured it by uh, displacement and has a volume of 25.64, okay? And so we just plug and play, plug the numbers in, okay? Being aware of your sig figs, the numerator has five sig figs, the denominator has four sig figs. So your answer should have uh, no more than four sig figs because the volume number is least accurate, okay? <clears throat> Here's some practice problems and we'll go through these very quickly here. The density of chloroform, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, 1.48 grams per milliliter, okay? The question says, how many grams would 17.5 milliliters of chloroform mass, all right? And so, yeah, using the stepwise procedure that we've been talking about, we are given to identify the units that you're looking for, which is grams, okay? Uh, and what we're given is 17.5 milliliters of chloroform, okay? And so we're gonna have a factor here to, to get to convert us from volume into grams. We're given the density of chloroform as 1.48 grams per milliliter. So that means that obviously we want milliliters in the denominator because we wanna cancel that and we want grams in the numerator, okay? So we got 1.48 grams divided by one milliliter, okay? And now you just plug and play, plug that number in 
and be aware of your sig figs. Uh, keep in mind, density is a measurement, therefore would be a factor, it's not an exact number. Density is a measurement and being a measurement, there's a degree of uncertainty and therefore it could play a factor with respect to sig figs. So 1.48 has three sig figs. We're given 17.5, which has three sig figs. So our answer should have no more than three sig figs, okay? So that's what we are given. We set up our conversion factor based on the uh, density of chloroform, okay? And we end up with 25.9 grams. So another way to say this, if I were to go to the lab and I had a graduated cylinder, you see pictures now of the graduated cylinder, and I measured out 17 and a half milliliters of chloroform, because chloroform is a liquid, okay? I now, I don't have to go out and actually weigh it. Why? Because I know that the density of chloroform is 1.48. Therefore, now I can simply calculate the mass, the weight of that volume I just measured out. And guess what? I can do the opposite. If I know the weight of a liquid, okay, by measuring it, and I know the density of that liquid, I can calculate the volume that I use, that I measured out, that I weighed out. Okay, it works both both directions, right? Because density is grams per mil or mils per gram. All right, let's do another example. In this scenario. <clears throat> they're asking you the volume, which you just stated, okay? We are looking for the volume of chloroform. If it weighed 0 0.0735 grams, okay? Now, we still have chloroform that hasn't changed, but we're going to need it with grams in the denominator, 1.48, and milliliters in the numerator. And so now I just simply take 0 0.0735 uh, and divide it by 1.48. And that would tell me the volume of a 0 0.0735 grams, okay? So I went from mass to volume and also went from volume to mass. And I, what I need to do that is the density of that material. Obviously here we're talking about uh, uh, liquids. All right, so any questions about that? We kind of briefly got to jump into an additional topic which has to do with temperature. Now temperature is a measure of an atom's energy. And this is quite self-explanatory. It makes sense that hot molecules move very fast. They do. You know, think of a boiling, boiling water. You know, it's steaming. It's coming out of the pot. You're making some water to, to make some spaghetti. As that thing is boiling, you put your hand on top. You can feel that, that vapor coming out of there because they have high energy. You put a lot of energy into the system to get it to go from the liquid physical state to the gas phase. And on the, contra on the contrast is that um, cold molecules move slow. Why? Because their energy has, is much, much lower, okay? So temperature is just, a, is obviously we use a temperature to measure, excuse me, we use a thermometer to measure a temperature. Okay, which the temperature rise or decrease is the result of the energy in the molecule. So, okay, the temperature is a property of the energy in the system. Okay, now we use, uh, there are three temperature scales that are used. Obviously, we're familiar using the English units, the Fahrenheit. Okay, uh, in the metric, we, that is called Celsius. Now there's one more additional uh, um, scale. We call that Kelvin, uh, named after Lord Kelvin, a scientist in, uh, from England, okay? When 
the thing about uh, the Fahrenheit scales and uh, the um, Celsius, they go in both directions to infinity, okay? Celsius goes to infinity, whatever temperature may be, and either up or, or negative direction. However, Kelvin only goes, stops at zero. At absolute zero is what is called uh, zero K temperature. Okay, that is the uh, temperature by which it's been proposed that all matter, matter stops moving, absolute zero. Now we come very, very close temperature to get down there, but not quite. We're getting there. And very fascinating, uh, a lot of the properties, a lot of the effects of what's happening at low, low temperature, totally new based on what's happening up here at ambient temperature. So new, new science occurring down there, okay? All right, now, <laughs> do you have to memorize the conversion from one or the other? No, no, you don't. Why? Because in the shapes table, you have the equation to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So if you have Fahrenheit, the equation is to take Fahrenheit, subtract 32 and divide by 1.8, that gives you Celsius. If you have Celsius, you multiply by 1.8 and you add 32 and you got Fahrenheit. Calvin, on the other hand, to get to Calvin, you must be in Celsius. And there's no relationship between Fahrenheit and Calvin, only between Calvin and Celsius. And you simply add 273 to your Celsius temperature. Therefore, if you're given the temperature in Fahrenheit and asked to convert that to Calvin, obviously I need to take the Fahrenheit, convert that to Celsius first, then add 273. And so an example here says the uh, temperature can get up to 115 Fahrenheit. What is the temperature in Celsius and Kelvin? I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to the uh, calculation, but it should be 46 Celsius and 319 Kelvin, okay? All right, uh, go, going briefly back to uh, energy a little bit. We have two containers here. Some of the questions they ask you is like, you kind of scratch your head, right? Uh, it's asking you here, uh, uh, you have two diagrams, uh, two uh, uh, diagrams, an A and B, obviously looks some kind of a liquid. You got a thermometer, it looks like, could be a thermometer because of the temperature reading. And guess what? Both of them are at 100 degrees and then they come and ask you, uh, which of these two beakers has a higher temperature? Well, they're both the same, right? They're both 100 degrees. Why? Because they're both being heated at 100 degrees. They both have the same and the and amount of energy necessary to get them up to 100 degrees. What could be a little bit more challenging is the second question. They ask you, which has the greater amount of heat? Which do you think has the greater amount of heat slash energy? It really should be the term amount of energy, A or B. Another way to look at it is this, you know, if given the choice for hot water, for you to get spilled with hot water, would it be best to have a little small cup of hot water boiling spilled on you? or a big old pot of hot water that you're getting ready for spaghetti. They're both boiling, right? So they're both boiling at uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so which do you think would, would have the greater amount of energy? A. A, exactly. Simply because there's more molecules. There's more mass in A. And therefore, more energy is 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 necessary uh, to cause the molecules of A to kick it up to 100 degrees uh, Celsius uh, Fahrenheit in this case. Okay, that that mass has a lot has a great effect on 
For example, El Nino, if you're familiar with that, El Nino is not a little kid. It is a body of water sitting out there in the Pacific, a very large body of water. And uh, as you may or may not know, there's temperature differentials that occur in uh, bodies of water. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in the river by, or in the swimming pool and all of a sudden the water kind of temperature changes around you. Well, you know, it's not all homogeneous. There's a gradient. Well, El Nino, there's a body of water out there in the Pacific that happens to have a little bit higher temperature, a couple of degrees higher than the rest. That slight increase in temperature because of the mass of the El Nino has a very large effect on the world weather. And the same is true for La Nina, which is basically the same phenomena, just a smaller body of water, okay? So when we talk about energy, we always talk about going downhill, meaning that it, it, mother, mother nature be mother nature will never spontaneously go up, uphill, okay? It goes downhill from a high energy state to a lower energy state, okay? And in order to kick it up, uphill, you gotta put energy into the system. You gotta boil water, right? It's not gonna boil spontaneously. You gotta put energy into the system. But once you got water boiling and you're making a cup of coffee, for example, well, that temperature dissipates and it releases from a high state to a low state. It's analogous to, let's say, for example, here, think about this. You're in the shower in the morning, it's nice and chilly, but you're in your hot shower, you're inside, you're all nice and warm, and you step outside. Once you're done, what happens? You get cold, right? Think about it. You're in the shower, higher temperature than the rest of your room. You step out, all that, you're of higher energy, that energy is released, it goes through the room. You get cold. What do you do? You jump back into the shower to warm up a little bit, right? Because now your temperature has dropped. You are at a lower temperature than the shower, shower area. So now you warm up, okay? Eventually, everybody, everything equilibrates to whatever temperature, ambient temperature you're at. Okay, so heat transfers from high to low. Okay, and so if you've got a cookie, took it out of the oven, what's going to lose the heat? Obviously the cookie, because it's hot. And who gains that heat? Your hand. You might gain too much heat and burn your hand. Okay, so always from high to low. Um, okay, take a, a piece of metal, place it in the freezer. The metal is then put in the bucket of hot does the temperature of the metal increase, decrease, or stay the same? What do you think happens to it? Okay. So you got the piece of metal in the freezer and you stick it in a bucket of hot water. What is gonna happen to that temperature? What happens to the temperature of the metal? What is your intuition telling you? It decreases. It decreases, okay decreases? Does it get colder? I thought I heard decrease. Yeah, I'm saying that the, if you put it hot metal in a bucket of water, I'm, I'm thinking that the metal decrease, what a, the temperature decreases. It goes the other way. It increases? Yeah, because right now you are at, you're at a low temperature because it's frozen. You put it into a hot environment, it's going to take that. Oh, it's that hot water. I'm sorry. I was yeah. thinking cold water. Oh, no, no. Well, even at cold water. But we'll talk about that depending, depending on who has a higher energy. Okay. So remember, energy always travels from high to low. So even if it was cold water and your piece of metal came out from the freezer, which has a lower temperature, that heat from the cold water will be transferred to that metal and that metal will go up in temperature until they equilibrate okay and so um just like the analogy i use for the coming out of the coming out of the hot shower and going back in because it's cold heat energy always travels from high to low okay high to low 
All right, so the, the temperature of the metal will, will increase because it gains heat, be it hot water or even being cold, because remember, it is the, if it is in the freezer, it's much lower than it, it's at zero degrees, which would probably be a lot, uh, it would be a lot colder than cold water, okay, or ambient water. Um, and eventually the temperature of water decreases to e equilibrate. And uh, the thing to take away from this, if you your coffee is way too hot in the morning when you make it, just stick a couple uh, a cold uh, spoon in it or a couple of them. That's gonna, what's gonna happen, your hot cup of coffee is gonna transfer its heat it has to the cold, cold uh, spoon. Temperature of the spoon goes up, temperature of the water, hot coffee drops. Eventually, if you leave everything alone and you know you come back 30, 40 minutes later, everybody's your room temperature. It energy eventually equilibrate. All right. <clears throat> so uh, obviously we got an exam coming uh, Thursday. Uh, don't forget to do the, the worksheets. Uh, you have uh, two sets of uh, uh, YouTube videos, one done by Dr. Smith uh, uh, that you can see beforehand. Then obviously you have this one done here. Uh, and then uh, work the problems. Uh, don't forget your sig figs. Always in whatever problems you calculate, whatever, any from to the end of the semester, uh, we always have sig figs. So just because we're done with sig figs doesn't mean that we don't use it again. We will always continue to use it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are done with chapter three. And uh, we're moving.